we are going. You can just count that to five and then put it down and then you can begin. Should I just? Sure, that's fine. Okay. All right. My name is Robert Holzer. I am 80 years old and I was born in 1929 in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, my parents were quite poor and uh, in spite of all that I had a very happy childhood until in 1936 the Nuremberg laws arrived in Hungary too and my father lost his job. He worked for a big pharmaceutical and uh, cosmetical firm and after that uh, he just had to take all kinds of odd jobs so our life really turned upside down. Still uh, we were happy that we were still free but in 19 37, uh, all of a sudden the Nuremberg laws somehow made the Hungarians try to get rid of Jews in any way they can and they devised a method of asking people to prove that they are Hungarians going back to I don't know how many generations. Our problem was that I had a great-grandfather who was born in what was Czechoslovakia back. The reason for that was is that uh, his father was in the army, he was a sergeant, and they were stationed in what is the so-called Sudetenland today. And uh, because of that, because we couldn't prove that our ancestors were four or five generations way back born in Hungary because of that one particular birth we were declared foreigners. My parents, neither my parents nor my grandparents have ever left Hungary, have spoken any other language. <clears throat> they considered themselves Hungarians. From that point we were uh, in basically a award of the tourist police in Hungary. We had to go every month and get a stamp in a special uh, ID card uh, which allowed us to stay in Hungary for 30 more days. Uh, we felt very humiliated but uh, there was no choice. Uh, eventually uh, that was not enough though and the Hungarians said we have to prove some kind of citizenship. Well how can we have any citizenship other than Hungarian if we were never even out of Hungary? Uh, my, I remember going to the Czechoslovakian embassy where we explained that uh, what the problem was and of course they uh, practically laughed at us saying I mean what way, what, what, on what <coughs> premises do you uh, uh, want to ask for uh, Czech citizenship? My parents kept going back. Uh, my mother got more and more desperate. And I think because of uh, her crying and, and, and uh, uh, <coughs> begging, eventually they broke down and uh, they gave us a uh, Czechoslovakian uh, temporary passport. That was enough for the Hungarians not to come after us with the threat of deportation. By that time many other families unfortunately uh, faced the same fate. Either have some citizenship or uh, from any other country or we are going to deport you. Uh, the next step was uh, uh, back when uh, the Sudetenland was occupied by German forces. Then a very interesting uh, thing happened. The, we had to go to the German embassy, like most people holding Czech passports, and they issued 
a uh, German passport to us, which was, of course, a very, very uh, big problem because we knew that it would only take a few months and we would be in deep trouble, but we had no other choice but to accept it at the moment. Uh, yes, it happened after a few months we were called in, humiliated, they tore the passport, uh, our passport, and we were on the street again, uh, so-called homeless, in a sense that we do, did not have a country behind us. Uh, <clears throat> many times, uh, my, I remember that we had to leave the house because my parents were tipped off uh, by a kind uh, detective that uh, they were going to come and get us. So we were uh, sleeping in, uh, with different friends and relatives back then. And uh, eventually uh, it all came an end with uh, Hungary entering uh, World War II. And in 1941 then, shortly after, my father was called up for forced labor, uh, work, uh, they took him away, and uh, after that uh, uh, he was he never came home uh, until uh, the end of the war, when he miraculously survived. But that comes uh, later on. Uh, 1941, so they took him away, and my mother and I were uh, still, of course, in our old apartment. But somehow, uh, this process of looking after people who were not considered Hungarian stopped for a while because they had other th things to worry about. My uh, life has changed a great deal, especially at school. I was in the fifth grade when uh, 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 we had an art uh, lesson and uh, my art teacher was going around with a huge cane and noticed that somehow I colored my artwork in a different way than he did. And so he started to beat me with the cane until I was bleeding all over and uh, yelling, why don't you go to Palestine to sell oranges? I ran home and explained to my mother what happened and she, uh, her answer was to clean me up, uh, hold my hands, we went back to school and instead of complaining about the attitude of the teacher, uh, she apologized to him. And I couldn't understand it and when I questioned her she said, uh, you will understand that later. In school too, uh, the pressure uh, I felt more and more pressure in school. Uh, for example, I wanted to join the Boy Scouts very badly as an 11-year-old boy. I just uh, loved the uniform and everything else that went with it. And my mother took me to a Jewish Boy Scout group. Uh, and they were Boy Scouts, but we couldn't really officially even talk about it. It was an illegal Boy Scout organization and uh, uh, of course no uh, uniform. Uh, I dared to one day go to the Boy Scout store and get a kerchief and put it around my neck and went to school with it. And uh, hell broke loose. I was called to the principal. My mother was called in and uh, reprimanded that uh, she doesn't take, she doesn't watch me, and this is illegal, and uh, I was very humiliated. Uh, after that, I learned my lesson, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> enjoyed as much freedom as I can under the circumstances uh, with my friends. Uh, we were still assembling every afternoon in a park uh, we went to our uh, illegal Boy Scout meetings that was in the, in the basement of a synagogue. Uh, we were still uh, surviving and basically having a good time. The, uh, uh, in the meantime, my father, who was uh, 
uh, <coughs> doing his labor uh, duty in in Budapest in uh, in in Hungary in the countryside was in 1942 transferred to a uh, Yugoslavian Serbian uh, copper mine uh, that was that became famous in the history of uh, treatment of World War in, in during World War II the treatment of Hungarian Jews called Bor B O R uh, many 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 things have written about that it was a copper mine a huge copper mine and uh, the the Jewish uh, labor camp uh, members were working in the mine. Uh, my father was there for uh, two and a half or three years, I can't remember exactly. And uh, he, it was very hard, very hard labor. Uh, I remember a conversation with him after the war because I was very curious, how did he survive? Uh, there, are, there were 150,000 people in the camp and 144,000 died, but not because of uh, just starvation or uh, some other physical causes. It was because later on many of them were killed by the SS. However, I was curious while he was there, what, what was the reason? And he told me a very interesting story about uh, water. He, uh, he said that there were two kinds of people in the concentration camp. They got one canteen full of water for a day. And he said there, was, there were people who, the minute they received the water in the morning, they gulped it down. And there were others who maybe used half of it to drink it and the other half to wash themselves. And I asked my father, why waste the water? I mean, what can a half a can of a, a, a water do? And he said that he will let me figure this out, why he and, among other people, used half a canteen of water to wash himself. He said he didn't get any cleaner, so to speak. He still had lice and the usual thing but there was something more to it and in a few years I, I, I finally I, I discovered what he tried to tell me that he, the, the, the will to survive the, the fact that uh, his self-confidence his self-image basically e e was equal to that half a canteen of water that he doesn't give up he doesn't just uh, drink the water at once and he said small little things like this kept him alive. Uh, just to jump a little bit ahead, uh, they, they, when uh, the, the partisans of Tito in Yugoslavia were really pushing uh, the Germans out of Yugoslavia, uh, the Germans uh, then uh, lined up all the forced labor members and uh, forced them on a death march toward Germany. And during this death march, uh, many of them slaughtered in a uh, small uh, town in northern Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I think it was Novi Sad. My father was in the last uh, uh, group. And luckily, one morning he was captured by Tito's partisans. When uh, they were captured, they were given three choices. Uh, number one, to join them and fight the Germans. Number two is to work for them. Or number three, they could go back to liberated areas, live there. The partisans would give them uh, room and board. And they said, at the end of the war, you can go home. And my father was a very strong little guy about my size, but extremely strong. And uh, so he said I had never fought in my life. I don't know anything about weapons, but I am not a parasite. And he joined them and was working in a flour mill that worked for the Yugoslavian uh, 
uh, underground army, and he worked in that flower mill for about two years. And that's how he survived basically the war, and eventually he came home uh, after uh, <coughs> the war in Europe was over, a few months after. Uh, in the meantime, in Hungary, uh, some strange events took place because uh, in 1943, 19, 40, 42, 43, 44, governments came and governments went. Uh, the fact was that the regent of Hungary, we, had, we didn't have a king, we didn't have a uh, governor, we called it a regent, and the uh, regent was an admiral and Hungary didn't have any water, so the admiral came from the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and he was in a way a joke because a, a landlocked country with an admiral as his head and he loved to be on a white horse uh, in his uniform <coughs> riding around on holidays, but he was a typical member of the uh, uh, Hungarian aristocracy who disliked Jews but also disliked uh, bloodshed. He did not really care too much for uh, or, or violence. So uh, while uh, uh, he was in charge, uh, basically the Jewish laws were very strict and our life uh, was quite uh, 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 restricted and, and organized so that we didn't have a great deal of freedom, but we were not at danger of being killed, and we knew that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Hungarian governments who were made up of aristocrats, who had basically the same idea, uh, each government tried to tighten uh, the the laws around us uh, at the uh, demand of the Germans. Hungary was not occupied by Germany until 1944, March 19th, because Hungary was such a loyal ally of Germany, sent uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of soldiers to the Eastern Front. Uh, you know, the Jews were working in labor camps. So Germany was very happy that they don't have to spend any manpower and money uh, in Hungary to control the situation there. The Hungarians took care of that. Uh, during that time, uh, I was uh, uh, finishing uh, the, my junior high school and I couldn't go on to high school. By that time, Jews were not allowed in high school. I was uh, I had a little job. Uh, I was a uh, bicycle kind of a uh, <clears throat> what do you call these people courier for a uh, an architectural firm, and uh, I made a little money. And also, my father's former employer <clears throat> helped us with uh, paying the rent, and so we managed somehow. In the meantime, uh, one of my aunts uh, decided to save our family. Uh, uh, she had a very interesting story. Her husband was the first ones to uh, be called up for forced labor in Hungary and was sent to the Eastern Front to, uh, for minesweeping. Uh, they had absolutely no uh, education in the matter. They had no idea what they were doing and uh, practically the entire unit was wiped out within a few days. Uh, however, before that, he went to a photographer and sent home a picture in which he was Hungar in a Hungarian military uniform. Uh, that was of course nonsense uh, because it was a big mistake because uh, Jews who were called up for labor camps, they had to bring their own clothing and they couldn't wear anything that uh, even resembled the Hungarian military. Uh, 
this picture did an incredible uh, uh, thing for us. She went with this picture to the police and said, uh, I am exempt from the Jewish laws. My husband is a uh, Gentile and it's in the military. Also, it helped that uh, in the meantime, while the father was on the front and well, he was killed, uh, her son was born and the little boy was blonde and blue-eyed. And he also pushed the little boy always and asked people about, uh, uh, do you think this is a Jewish child? So together with the picture and uh, the child, somehow she became a con woman and uh, uh, the police gave her uh, papers that were only issued to Gentiles, ID uh, papers. With this, she decided, she set out to uh, save the family and uh, rented an apartment uh, in a completely different uh, part of the town. First, she took her mother and then anyone else in the family who needed uh, a roof could go uh, and, and, and do this. One day, uh, she asked me what I was going to do, and I, what, what I do in general, I said, well, by that time, I was called up for youth labor camp, which meant that every day I had to spend about six hours uh, somewhere in Budapest uh, digging uh, anti-tank devices. Apparently, by that time, the Hungarians were expecting that the war eventually would reach Budapest and used us, uh, young Jewish uh, kids, to come out and, and do that. And these anti-tank uh, devices were all, these ditches and everything else, they were all on the border of Budapest and uh, the, 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 the countryside. So that is very important to understand what happened later on because, as I said, one Hungarian government fell after another because the Germans finally demanded more and more and more and uh, uh, the, the regent had to look for people who were capable of, of uh, uh, appeasing the Germans and not doing a great deal of damage to the country. This all came to an end in 1944, March 19th, when the Germans finally sensed that uh, Hungary might want to leave uh, the Nazi uh, uh, alliance, the Axis, and join perhaps with the Allies. Uh, there were rumors flying in the air because Romania was already out of the war and they thought perhaps Hungary would do the same. The Soviet army was coming very close to Hungary up from the north and east and uh, the Romanian forces also joined the Soviet forces and were attacking uh, from the east. Under the circumstances, the Germans uh, occupied Hungary, Eichmann arrived, and now the deportation started. They emptied the countryside first. I woke up one day in, I think it was July, 1944 July, and realized that my mother's family, who came from the country, they uh, were gone. They were all taken to Auschwitz. My grandparents, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, everybody was gone. And none of them came back after the war. None, not one person of my mother's family who lived in the countryside survived. At least not to my knowledge. In the meantime, we knew that eventually, once they emptied the countryside, which was extremely swift, because in no country did the Germans get as much cooperation as in Hungary. They practically had 
absolutely no manpower invested in the whole uh, campaign because uh, the Hungarian uh, town and village mayors, uh, the gendarmerie, they were all eager to help and uh, show their efficiency and loyalty to the cause. Uh, but finally they came to Budapest uh, and there was all of a sudden very quiet. There were rumors that the regent put down his foot and said, I do not want the Jews of Budapest to be deported at the moment and uh, uh, <coughs> others said that the reason he did that because he held us as bargaining chips with the Allies. Uh, in 1944, October 15th, our regent went on radio and announced in a uh, uh, 15, I think it was a 15 minute speech, that as far as he was concerned, the war was over and lost. He didn't want any more uh, uh, Hungarian blood shed and therefore he sent his emissaries to the Allies uh, and wanted to take Hungary out of the war. When he finished his speech, by that time he was surrounded by German troops and taken away. Uh, what this meant for us was a terrible, terrible thing because the so-called reign of terror started. There was a splinter group, uh, a, 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 a rather a fringe group in Hungary. They were called the Arrow Cross Party. And the people of that party, even in the fascist uh, regime in Hungary, uh, the party was most of the time outlawed. This was a party made up of absolutely the bottom of society, the ones who are, who were uh, just totally hopeless, uh, uh, full of hate because they had nothing, uh, uh, full of envy because they never amounted up to anything. Uh, th these are people who couldn't even get a, the lowest factory jobs because first of all, they didn't want to work. Most of them were alcoholics. It, it, it was a terrible, terrible uh, a group of people, plus some young kids who were very impressed with the uh, uniform. They wore black uniforms with an armband that had a red armband, just like the German armband, and a white, but in, in the white, uh, it was not a swastika, but a cross with arrows on each point. So they called themselves the arrow cross. Uh, party. Now this party was very much uh, on the fringe during the war years, but now the Germans didn't trust any more a legitimate Hungarian government appointed by the region and let them out of prisons, out of the, the pubs, and uh, anybody who wanted uh, basically a weapon could have one. And these people created a terrible situation on the streets of Budapest. There was, there was no more ID card, no more this and that. Uh, in the meantime, well, this, well, before uh, uh, we came to September 15th, my uh, mother and I moved in with my aunt uh, and because we thought that was uh, the best to do at the moment. We had false IDs. And uh, since the Soviet army was pushing inside into Hungary, a lot of refugees came to Budapest and we pretended to be refugees now. The ID documents had to be carefully uh, made out so that uh, they were, we were born in a city that was already occupied by Soviet forces so they couldn't really call up and say, would you please check your registry and see if these people are uh, from this particular town. Uh, but 19, after 1944, 
uh, October 15th, nothing mattered anymore. ID card or this or that. If somebody said you were a Jew on the street, uh, they shot you right there. In the meantime, the war came very close to the city and street fighting started. Uh, the Soviet army and, and the SS that stayed inside the Budapest all of a sudden was surrounded by the Soviet army and the siege of Budapest started. The siege of Budapest was one of the bloodiest sieges in World War II, uh, the only second in the city siege to Stalingrad. The, uh, the, the, uh, the situation in the city became more and more hopeless. Uh, there was very little food and uh, uh, total chaos. Uh, the hospitals uh, were completely empty. The doctors were sent to the front and uh, there was not much to eat. And it's important to understand this uh, as to what happened to me. Because my mother and I ended up in a place, in a house, where there were eventually 400 Jews hiding in Budapest. This house was organized by a former fascist official, a member of the Arrow Cross. He joined the Arrow Cross when he was 18, and now he was 25 or so, 20, 25 years old, and he decided that he, will, he would do something good in his life. After that, using his former connections, he organized this huge house into a hospital, emptied the basement. Uh, this was before the siege began, so he had time, he emptied the basement, Ask all people in living in the house, all Jews, uh, to help him. Uh, started programs the women, uh, how to be nurses, and the men how to be technicians. And he brought in the 30 most famous Jewish doctors of Budapest into this place. Did everything to bring in supplies. And an underground operation started of, uh, of an amazing, amazing, uh, uh, it was amazing procedure because uh, uh, he really did something very daring and he put his life uh, <coughs> out there too. Uh, at the moment when this all started, uh, we didn't have many patients because, you know, Budapest was still calm and uh, people didn't need to go uh, in a great la large numbers to any clinic or hospital. But when the siege started, when the fighting started to come to the center of the city, the situation became chaotic. You, nobody could walk on the street anymore. Uh, Russian airplanes were flying at rooftop uh, height, practically machine gunning everything on the street. And the hospital of Jews started to work. And pretty soon we were working 24 hours a day, operating, uh, taking care of uh, the dying, taking care of uh, the injured, uh, everything. There were 30 doctors done, the whole city block was emptied. Uh, this man had even his little print shop. Uh, he forged all kinds of papers with which he emptied the neighboring uh, houses, basements, and set it up as a hospital too. Uh, the operation became bigger and bigger by the day, and but so did the bloodshed on the street. Uh, we all had all kinds of tasks. But the most important task was is to feed ourselves and feed the people in uh, the injured in the hospital. And uh, uh, on the street, of course, it was, uh, the situation was beyond imagination. There were death and injured everywhere. Uh, the uh, Soviet uh, artillery was shooting into the city. 
so you couldn't even predict where uh, you know something will end up and uh, shrapnels and everything else so on top of everything a Hungarian cavalry unit uh, was in the city they couldn't feed their horses they let the horses run around uh, and we were lucky if the horse the horse was hit maybe uh, with something and lay down because we run out with huge knives and carved out the horse meat and that too was uh, precious uh, food back those days uh, basically uh, uh, then uh, the the siege uh, ended on 1940 uh, 5 January 18th. During our stay, during our stay in this so-called, in, in that bogus hospital, three times the arrow cross was tipped off and came to take us out of the house. There were two possibilities. They were taking Jews into the ghetto. They constructed a ghetto in the center of Budapest where they all, from the old Jewish district uh, they surrounded it by a wooden wall, and according to the rumors, it was detonated. It, it was, uh, uh, they laid dynamite, and in case of uh, uh, the Soviet victory in Budapest, they would have dynamited it in the last moment. Well, luckily, uh, that never happened. But uh, uh, I did not want to go to the ghetto ever, so I would do anything. Uh, the other alternative was much worse. Uh, many times they were not taking people to the ghetto, they were taking them down to the Danube, where they tied them together, make them took uh, their shoes off, and shut them into the Danube River. Today, on the part, on the side of the Danube River where all this happened, there is a beautiful uh, uh, monument to the victims of this bronze shoes all over on the, the sidewalk uh, and unfortunately uh, frequently this is dishonored uh, and 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 uh, terrible things are happening to these bronze little shoes <coughs> the uh, uh, so going back uh, uh, to uh, what happened in the house Three times they came for us. Two times our leader uh, could uh, talk them out of it, uh, could convince them that he knows exactly that these are Jews, but they are working, and uh, it's for the sake of the uh, Hungarian state. The third time, just three days before liberation, uh, a man appeared with 32 uh, arrow cross uh, of his bodyguards uh, with submachine guns they surrounded the entire uh, the premises and they said this time there is no mercy we are going to be taken down to the Danube our uh, leader just asked one thing they brought him out too uh, they uh, put a revolver to his head and they said you are going to go with them he said before we go I just would like you to see what you are destroying here and ask if the leader of the group can come and, and take a look at the situation. Uh, they were gone for about an hour and a half and when they came back uh, he lined us up and said that what I had seen here is beyond my imagination. I never thought that Jews are capable of doing this and I want to thank you for your work and I will be the Minister of Jewish Affairs after the war, which is going to be over very soon because the Germans invented the magic weapon. And then I, each of you will be then uh, given uh, the same kind of uh, papers and identity as Gentiles in Hungary. You will be honorary Gentiles in the new Hungary. Of course, this was, I mean, the most stupid thing we have ever heard in our life, <laughs> but we uh, 
Uh, we didn't, of course, say anything. We didn't object. The fact was, we survived. After this, three days after this, uh, one morning, uh, the first little 18-year-old Soviet soldier in his fur hat put his head through the uh, emergency exit in our basement where the hospital was, and we knew that as far as we were concerned, the war was over. I took my mother's hand and I asked her to let's go back and see what happened to her apartment. We left our belongings there a great deal if there's anything left and didn't even uh, turn around and at least give a hug to the man who saved our lives. Uh, this uh, eventually began to bother me when I was an adult, that as a 15 year old I was so ungrateful, and so uh, I always said that if I ever find out what happened to this man, uh, but if I knew, I said, I mean, he was much older than I, I thought he was about 35 years old. I mean, every 15-year-old looks up, I was a small kid, and he was very tall and very, you know, uh, dashing figure with all the weapons on him, and he was in fascist uniform. Uh, I, I kind of give up, but eventually uh, something happened. Uh, a friend of mine from Seattle gave me a phone call that a new book uh, came out, was published a few years ago, called The Siege of Budapest. And uh, I knew that nobody dared to write a book about the Siege of Budapest because Everything was burned. All the archives in Hungary, in Budapest, were burned to the point not much material was left. And I was very stunned that somebody finally did it. I bought the book and uh, did something which I had never done before. I went to the index pages and looked up, and all of a sudden there was the uh, name of the man who saved my life, who saved 400 people's lives. And I had, I had never seen any reference to this before. Immediately I turned to these pages, three pages in the book are the story of our house. And uh, uh, I called a friend of, in, of mine in Hungary. Within hours I was in touch with the author. And he said uh, in his email, uh, I don't know, I interviewed this man two years ago uh, because it took time to, the, for the book to be published. This was his address, this was his phone number. He was very much alive and he's 11 years older than you are. And I immediately said to my wife, I have to go. And I got my ticket and uh, arrived in Hungary and the next day I went to see him and I had two visits with him. He is, of course, 11 years older than I. I didn't want to exhaust him. Also, he's a chain smoker and uh, he's, he breathes heavily, very heavily. But it was two beautiful conversations. I, I knew that he wouldn't uh, recognize me because he never really knew me. I was one of the 400s, a, a little kid running around there. I was not somebody that he dealt with uh, day by day in the house, and I reassured him that he doesn't really know me. Probably he had never seen, never laid an eyes on me. And But the, uh, after that, our conversation, of course, went on because uh, we were in the same place at the same time. And I thanked him profusely and uh, he gave me his personal diary to read, uh, which then I returned to him on the second visit. And uh, uh, <clears throat> that was the last. I met him. Uh, he, I knew that he's, because of his age and uh, perhaps even illness, he's not one who is going to start corresponding with me. I never, I had not, not hoped for that. So it was enough that, that I, I had these two meetings with him and told him how grateful I am and that uh, acknowledged that without him I wouldn't be here. And 
uh, he, he's still alive. I know that because I have some people who occasionally uh, check on him. He's well off. He doesn't need anyone's uh, uh, you know, personal assistance. And he has a, beauty, a beautiful home in a very nice section of Budapest. I, I do not want to go back to Hungary. That was my last visit because I, the country was never really very good to me. And today I don't even say I'm a Hungarian, which I used to when I was younger. I just say I was born in Hungary when they asked me. And that's it. Uh, I don't really care for what's going on in Hungary today because it reminds me, unfortunately, very much of, of uh, what happened to me at the moment, except that uh, it, it's not with Jews, it's with gypsies. Now, if there weren't any gypsies, then it would be the Jews. And since Hungary has a large group of people who survived because of Budapest, uh, the, I think today there are uh, close to 100,000 Jews in Hungary. Okay. So that was that is my story. <laughs>